If you look, uh, aluminium. Now, all of the militaries in the world want the answer to this question. And I think when I explain with the visuals, they'll, they'll know how Hutchison technology is doing transmutations of elements and how it all works. So, you know, it's literally priceless, but like I say, it's better if I tell people. <laughs> it's, it's a safer pr approach to things. Right. So aluminium here, you can see that whilst the, the um, atom is a boson, so we can go into the structure, because bosons can go into the structure, as you go into an EVO, my understanding is it strips off the electrons. This is why it throws them out. Okay? So if it completely ionizes your uh, aluminium, the nucleus of the aluminium, or is it aluminium, is a fermion. So as it gets into there, it's under this immense pressure, and it can't occupy the same space time. So you take four atoms, and I've done the calculations, yeah. but it's very simple. You can do it in a couple of seconds using this calculator yeah. here. Okay. Um, so you've got your aluminium down here. It's really quite efficient. It's the bottom of the second uh, uh, nucleon, uh, sorry, atomic volume. Yeah. If that fissions, sorry, uh, nucleon exchanges, you get magnesium and uh, silicon forming. Okay? Yeah. Now, the magnesium and silicon are both larger atoms, okay, when they go back into our three space and regain their electrons. Yeah. But when they're in there, they only occupy, the four atoms of aluminium occupy the space of only two, magne one magnesium and one silicon. So what you see is you have two units of 10, sorry, four units of 10, which is 40, replaced by one unit of 12 and one unit of 14, which is less so the nature is trying to pack it into a small box, that's why you get the diamond. And, and so that's why it's going there. Now the other interesting thing is that if it still stays as a fermion, and there are some of the nucleon exchange reactions, in fact the, the first nucleon exchange reaction that you have is one nucleon being exchanged between two aluminium atoms. And what does that produce? Well if we go to uh, silicon, it produces this isotope, uh, 29, uh, silicon 31, which is fermionic. Okay. Mm -hmm. And it also produces magnesium, uh, 25. That is the first exchange reaction. So what, you, that's the, the, you're only, only exchanging two nucleons out of two aluminiums. And that is also fermionic. What does that do? Well, we know because the P and Telly proved that the, the, the proton comes out. That's fermionic, so it can't live in the pressure system. Tritium comes from Lena. It can't live in the pr pressure system. And on other Hutchinson samples, at the other end of the periodic table, all the way up here, well, in the middle we've got nickel, uh, the aluminium we looked at in Sochi, in Russia, um, the fermionic isotope was 3.7 times natural, natural ratio, when all of the other isotopes were in natural ratio. The 207 isotope was 70% more than natural ratio. Okay, huge variation. And the interesting thing is, this isn't by some uh, process of thermal process, because it, you would normally concentrate one, L, one isotope at the end of the isotopic mass chain. Right? There's not that, that kind of separation. This is a separation by fermionic status. So what's happening, when this exchange reaction is occurring to try and get more aluminium atoms into the same space time because of this intense pressure, uh, the, the first exchange is of one that produces fermionic isotopes. It, it spit out fer fermionic magnesium and fermionic silicon. That means they're out of the system. Now, uh, and, and interestingly, if you look, uh, it's fermionic with its electrons, and the magnesium is fermionic with its electrons. So they, they, it's more difficult for them to go in, in my view, but that, I'm less certain about that. So then, with, with all that in, in situation, what would you expect to happen at the end of the process? I don't know. Okay, I'll show you here. In the case of the tungsten exposed to a Mars gas, it starts off smooth. This is looking in really smooth. A few seconds exposure to the Mars gas, right? And the, the plasmoids are formed in the material, and you have these spheres that are bursting through the surface of the tungsten. Why is it a sphere bursting through the surface of the tungsten of calcium? In every case, it's calcium. It's also synthesizing sodium, magnesium, aluminium, silicon, sulfur, potassium, and titanium. Uh, and iron, but why in every case, but not in every case for everything else, is it producing calcium? What is that telling you? It's the most likely outcome. Now, if we go into the Parkamov tables, based on a system that produces the, the most intense pressure, it would have to produce, the, 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 the output would have to give the most benefit, i.e. the biggest yield. We run it in the Parkamov tables, and what do we get? The tungsten, the, the most energetic reactions you can get from all the isotopes of tungsten, synthesize calcium and xenon.
Same logic applied in the same place. Now what's happening? Let's go back over to our uh, atomic volume chart. So our tungsten's all the way down here. Other than osmium, it's, it, given the number of nucleons, it's one of the smallest uh, uh, atoms there are with yeah, its electrons. Yeah, yeah. Now, if we have two atoms of tungsten coming together, uh, and they occupy, where is it? Uh, let's say 10 units of whatever, an arbitrary unit. Yeah. And then that fissions, as we've observed experimentally, and yeah. this thing process occurs. Yeah. Xenon is all the way up here. One atom of xenon. So we're just asking for one atom to fission. Okay. One atom of xenon is all the way up here at 40 something. Yeah. That's going to cause an intense pressure under the surface of that tungsten. And then um, the atom of calcium, uh, where is it? Here is 26 units. So just the calcium alone is going to be 2.6 time, times the volume of the original tungsten atom. Forget about the xenon being all the way up here. Right. So that causes the sphere, when it comes back into our three space, to smash the tungsten off the top. And you see these particles of tungsten that have been, uh, when we used a vacuum, we, we, George Eagley came with me, and this is the experiment I kind of devised. We, we have a bucket here to catch detritus falling down, x-rays through holes, and then over the top he's got a vacuum cleaner with a face mask on to catch yeah, the yeah, particles. Yeah. And in the particles, over here, you can see that you have uh, aluminium, uh, silicon, magnesium, sodium, potassium, calcium, titanium, iron, in the filter. So when it was blowing stuff off the surface, you're seeing the synthesized products in the filter that we put over the vacuum cleaner. Wow. Okay, so it's not just on the surface, it's not contamination. Yeah. And the, the, the idea behind this experiment is we provided the foliated tungsten rod, right? It's in free air and it goes into protective pa packaging and we walk away with it. And then it goes under the SCN, yeah, yeah. right? So there's no chance of contamination. And the idea that you've got spheres that have got all these elements that were not in the original material and they are actually underneath a piece of tungsten that's like folded up. Right. The idea that you could get contamination, drill out a channel, put the, put the contamination under, yeah, so that yeah. the sphere is partially under yeah, the... Yeah. It's like, it's so you have to do all kinds of logic right, gymnastics right, right, to get right. there. Now, on the Hutchison sample, yeah. these pimples, where the aluminium has become uh, magne uh, magnesium and silicon, okay. they're raised up, they're domes. Yeah, 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 okay. Because their atomic volume like, is larger. Like this. Yeah. Exactly the same. Yeah. And like the indium. So we expose the indium, which actually despite being 0.75 of a mic uh, 75 microns thick, the thickness of human hair, yeah. and only melting it in a little more than 150 degrees. I chose something that had a very low melting point yeah. also. Yeah. It survived longer in the Amazigas jet, jet flame than one millimeter of titanium. Longer. And it's the thickness of a human hair, and it melts at stupid low temperature. Interesting. For, in, in a way, it might be because it forms the indium nitride on the surface and that holds it together, but it didn't seem to want to melt. So that's bizarre in its own right. Yeah. But then it fell down onto, if you can imagine this bucket, it fell onto the bucket and immediately solidified. Yeah. Uh, and you could see in the high speed vi video that it went from being incandescently bright to so that, that you couldn't see the rest of the room. <laughs> Uh, because the camera's adjusted its uh, uh, iris to the smallest level yeah, it can, yeah. and it's still incandescently bright, blowing it out. It hit the bottom, and in the reflection, you can see the incredibly short time frame that it, because it, it's a highly conductive element, which is bizarre. Why yeah. wouldn't it turn to a liquid yeah. when it's incandescent bright? It's all, yeah. all kinds of bizarre things going on. So, uh, having had a prediction of why it would be a really valuable thing, because you've got Parkamov saying that if you're over a thousand degrees, you're going to be synthesizing these relic neutrinos, and his the 25 years of studies of uh, relic, not relic neutrinos in that case, ultra cold, low, synthesized low, low energy neutrinos. He's look, he, he did 25 years of studying relic neutrinos lensed onto beta isotopes to change the, the beta isotope decay rate. You're saying it's taken a beta isotope. I chose something with 87% beta isotope, which you can see from over here, has a, 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 a indium 115, uh, is 30,000 times the length of the universe, it's half-life. So if it's changing significantly, it's doing it quickly. Yeah. Black Evo is going in. What's happening? That is mostly, in my view, if we believe Shishkin, Bogdanovich, and, and, and potentially Parkinbov, that is going in, it's causing the beta isotope decay of the 
uh, of indium, which is indium-115, which normally has a 30,000 times the, the, the life of the universe half-life, it's releasing electrons. The electrons are then turning the, the black EVO into a white EVO, which then causes the transmutation. And if you look at what the transmutation is, uh, firstly, the form of the transmutation follows what we've seen here, what we've seen over there, and what we see in the Hutchison samples. Okay? And the form of the transmutation is, firstly, it looks like something energetically and hot went under the surface. Same thing as this. It's yeah. not on the surface, right. but Shoulder says Evos dishevel at the surface. But when they're dishevelling, some of it is in the surface and some of it is outside the surface. Where is the centre point of the Evo, of the action of the Evo? I don't know, but I suspect it's slightly below the surface. And so you have a situation where uh, something highly energetic is going on under the uh, surface. You have a higher temperature and strength in the oxide uh, or nitride on the surface. So this is our surface level here. Yeah. The energetic thing goes on underneath. It literally turns the indium into a plasma. It then comes out of a, 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 a liquefied bubble, right, right. raising the material up, and yeah. it sprays the plasma into the air, which rains down as perfect indium oxide crystals. Okay, And you can even see the debris field around it. Okay, And then the material that's synthesized is boiling out of the volcano. This is silicon dioxide. There's iron spheres here. Iron sphere here, you can't see it so clearly. Did, um, did Alan create these? Are these no, 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 this is what I did in India. This okay. is the one that I'm coming on to, which okay. is the end of the story. Okay. Um, but what you're seeing is the same effect. The indium is this atomic volume down here. It's in the middle of the table somewhere. Where is it? Here, right? And you're, you're synthesizing uh, calcium. You're synthesizing all the other elements, and, and the balance of them is still quite high. Yeah in terms of atomic volume, because one indium can split into several calcium atoms. Yeah. And so that causes, when it comes back into our three space out of the Evo, it's much, much physically larger, so you get the pimples on the surface. Yeah. And it has to extrude. And the idea that you've got silicon dioxide spewing out of the volcano, silicon dioxide, what temperature is that melting at? A lot higher than 150 degrees C. Yeah. But yet it comes out, and it's frozen so quickly. It goes... <laughs> Almost instantaneous yeah, freezing. Yeah, yeah. Um, now, so then, in the Mars of my brain's plate, I wanted to do a weakness test using the indium foil. And it's a thicker foil than that. That was 75 microns. I think this was 350 to 375 microns. So it's a much thicker foil. And uh, we put it in the Amaza vibration system. So there's no electrolysis, there's, there's just the vibration plates that's potentially creating the EVOs. It's sitting there, and we put it in for 10 minutes alone. OK? What do we see? On here, we've got these uh, impact craters with the synthesized elements around it. But over here, you see this beautiful structure down here. You've got it burrowing through the surface, transmuting stuff as it got to, and there's an event here, and it goes out. Part of it goes down here, but it explodes. And when you, I, I will share this image, but you've got this, uh, w w what you call a birdie on the x-rays, but uh, it's just maybe just coincidentally the same shape. Yeah. And um, in here, you've got diamond, diamond, uh, you have uh, all of these rich elements in here. It's freaking beautiful. Uh, but at the end, right up here, it's come up here, and then there's a structure here. It's just cut off, actually. Um, but uh, uh, this is the structure. You have silicon dioxide yeah. here, fingers like this. It's literally two fingers. Yeah. You can see maybe here and here. They're like two fingers like that. Yeah. And it's a spiral structure, and there's spiral holes that come around here where you've got eruptions from this. This is iron. There's another one with a spiral form on it, which is nickel. And it's coated in indium. And this is the end of the plasmoid as it's, it ended up dying. So this shows you that the structure comes up, and as it dies, it synthesizes the heavier elements. Now, when we wanted to, uh, when I bought this uh, indium in America, yeah. I said, can you take up a sample, because I want to test it for what it is to begin with right. uh, once we've done the test, if I see anything interesting. Yeah. Don't waste your time unless, <laughs> unless I see something yeah, interesting. Yeah, yeah. So I saw some things interesting. So this is the raw material section, uncleaned, which because that is what we actually put into the reactor. Just got a couple of bits of nitrides and some carbon on there, but it's almost essentially indium. Yeah. Then he put it into his $40 cleaner, because yeah. he said, we want it, let's test it after we cleaned it. For three minutes, there's the nice clean surface, and these are these two millimetre across explosion craters. And if you look at it under the SEM, uh, I was running out of time, we were just getting ready to fly here. Um, on this side over here, 
This is silicon dioxide blending into indium at the end, just as you saw in here. Of the of the of this thing, and over here there's a crest of a wave, and on part of the crest of the wave, other than the, the silicon and other elements over here, you, you've got fluorine blending out of the indium. So, so this is the this is a hundred dollar experiment. Letter reaction because of cleaning it. it it's serendipity. That's really that's it's but it, all it's doing is replicating what I saw here. Yeah. But it's doing it with a, a forty dollar yeah. denture yeah, cleaner. Yeah, yeah. So we want to replicate this, yeah. but the, frankly, I want to put it out there because everyone can have a go. Yeah. What everyone can't do is to see if um, under the electron microscope, which we, <laughs> he just said, I've cleaned the thing, he brought it in, and blah, 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 he went away for some food or drink. Yeah, Alan yeah did. Watch, watch the cleaning as it happens. Yeah, I mean, it foams up a bit, the cleaning yeah. product, but it, um, he, he uh, that's an opportunity too. Maybe you don't even need the cleaning product in there. Maybe you could just watch it and, and these, are, these are two millimeters across. You can see them with your naked eye. Yeah, yeah. But if someone could take a, a $70 Neurogo mac microscope for certain phones, it doesn't work very well on other phones, but on the it, Samsung S7, which you can get pretty good second hand, yeah. um, you could see this in all kinds of glory. Right. And that the other elements would at least appear as different colors from the bulk of the indium. Yeah. You could physically look at it. And also, because it, it's actually significant volumes, yeah. you could take some of the indium, dissolve it in acid, and, and then do iron tests on it. Yeah. And you could do it uh, on, on, just take an explosion crater. It's great because you can cut it, it cuts like butter, so you can cut it out with a, the knife on a, a, a Swiss army knife, sure. dissolve that in acid, and, and you can be able to see, see the typical elements that you yeah. synthesize, as like iron and so forth, yeah. uh, with, a, with a very little expense. Right. This, this could be done in every university, even high school. Right. Um, and, and it follows the same logic. It's not as intense, you know, and the great thing is this is going to kill anyone. Right. Because it, it's oh, at the oh, low right. end of the table. It's not yeah. doing what Erdemenko was doing, is synthesizing right. things that weren't in our near universe, right. right? It wasn't doing what Leclerc did in producing all these transuranics. Yeah. Now, maybe if you put it in there for too long, you'd set up a situation, but what I see here is resonant nodes. Now, when Hutchison was doing his work, his most effective work was when he had thin, long, samples that weren't so wide. Okay. So you've got three different resonant frequencies in there, yeah. but um, uh, the material, you know, it, it's able to set up resonant modes, I guess. And what I think you've got here in this point, this point, and this point, because the, the sample we put in there was only about that big. Yeah. It was about one centimeter by uh, four millimeters, maybe. Yeah. So, I mean, with the, the 50, uh, dollar or forty dollar piece of indium that I bought, yeah. you could probably run several hundred experiments. Wow. You know, it's freaking amazing, absolutely amazing. I don't know if we can do it again, but it happened in three minutes. Yeah. And the answer is synthesizing the same elements we saw in the Mars gas. And it's the same as this shit, the, sorry, excuse me, but that you see in the tungsten, this is the tungsten, and, and I took a large section of it, of the rod, and you can see, as it, uh, there's a plasmoid coming in here, and it's burrowing down, it's, it splits here, and it splits, and it goes all the way up here. So, and you can see, that it's literally like the Mid-Atlantic Ridge, and this is physically a large area. Yeah. When you look at one segment, you just see them going this way, or just going for short distances, but it isn't until you take, a very long right. and tedious yeah. um, thing and stitch it together, you actually see it's burrowing across these channels. Yes. So, <laughs> what, what's on at the moment, do you know? Uh, Chalani. Oh, 